Attention YouTube reviewer, the following video is filmed on a private gun range by a firearms expert. All firearms are handled responsibly and at no point are any bystanders present or ever at risk. The following video also contains no footage of full lot of firearms, bump stocks, firearm modifications, or firearm ammunition cells as defined by YouTube's community guidelines. This includes our outro. Welcome back guys. So today we're getting back to some military surplus gun reviews. Today we got an Italian M38 Carcarno short rifle. Uh, most people know about Carcarnos in the carbine configuration, which personally is not my favorite. I think it's a hideous gun. Um, but uh, less people know about the short rifles because well, they're less common. They made a lot of the, uh, the carbines in the later part of the war and I'll get into that in a little while. Uh, so basically, uh, in the uh, 1920s, before World War II, um, Italy wanted to get a smaller rifle uh, that was more compact for the troops. Uh, this is around the same time as I mentioned back in my old Mauser video that a lot of countries are starting to realize that you didn't need this big long rifle um, anymore uh, because the new cartridges were allowed you to shoot much further. Um, with the smokeless powder and stuff like that. And then also mechanized warfare was starting to become more prevalent as was shown in World War I. So the big long rifles were hard to get in and out of vehicles. So a lot of countries at this time were starting to switch to a carbine or a short rifle configuration for their main rifles. Uh, Italy was no different. But the thing with Italy was uh, their 6.5 Cacarno they had was really underpowered compared to a lot of the other countries at the time. I mean, you had, you know, America with 30-06, you had uh, the UK with their 3 British, and you had the uh, 8mm Mauser for the Germans. So they really wanted to kind of uh, upgrade their rifles, get more power out of them to kind of compete with the rest, but also make them a little bit shorter. And then uh, this is what happened. So they end up switching out of the uh, the 6.5 Kakarno, which everyone knows from the GFK shooting, down to the new 7.35, is that correct? Yeah, 7.35, which is basically a 30 cal. Now, another thing that they did is they left pretty much everything else the same. The, the bolt uh, face is the same, the chamber is identical, uh, the case is pretty much the same. Um, so uh, some of the older rifles were able to be simply bored out from the barrel to take the new cartridge. Now, uh, Italy actually only ran with the 735 for a little while. They actually discontinued it in World War II and switched back to the 6.5 platform because one, there was already a bunch of, of rifles that were 6.5. And then you had, uh, you know, both rifles at the same time in the same place. So, you know, you had to juggle you know getting the right rifles for the right ammo to the right squads and if you put the 6.5 ammo inside of the uh, uh the 7.3 at worst it's not gonna fire at best it's gonna fire but just tumbled because the bore is different if you have it the other way around you put a 7.3 inside of a uh, 6 uh, six five, it's probably not going to chamber but if you do get it to chamber then you can run into some major problems um so now that's one of the reasons why they ended up switching back to the 6.5 towards the other half of the war and why the 6.5 cartridge is far more uh, prevalent along with the, uh, uh, you know, also the carbines as well. Um, now everyone knows the carbine, the stock pretty much ends here and they have a, a built-in folding bayonet. This one also has a folding bayonet, but that's interesting. Uh, we'll get into that a little interesting. Now, uh, some of y'all may be looking at this rifle and thinking, man, that stock is shiny. And that's part of the reason why I actually bought this rifle. Um, as an example to show you guys, uh, what a fake German-captured 
Kakarno looks like because this is a fake German captured Kakarno and I'll show you all here in a little while why that is and how I know for a fact that it's a fake one is because the stock has been refinished. So I'll get into that in a little while but we'll just go over the Kakarno itself uh, first. So everyone knows the Kakarno. It's got this uh, moniker style uh, clip system here just like the moniker rifle and similar to the uh, M1 Grand, except for the fact that the, this drops out the bottom like a moniker and doesn't eject out the top. It also has the exact same top ejection system uh, like the M1 does. So you can, uh, not the M1, but the moniker. So you can sit here and pop this in and then you have a little trigger that you can stiffly push. Uh. Man, it does not want to come out, that it's probably because it's got one case in there already. If I can get this out. Let's see if it'll do it now with that a little bit less spring pressure. Man, it's not wanting to eject it. That's weird. Um, okay. That's not... <laughs> uh, oh! And I saved my brass because these are the seven, the seven five are harder to come by. Let me see here. Okay. So, so I pushed and, and fling it across the room, just like the moniker. Let me grab that real fast. Ready to go. Now these clips. They had a different, couple different versions of them. They had a steel version, and then they also had this lesser used brass version. The Kakarno carries eight, or sorry, six cartridges inside of this little clip, which was, you know, comparable to some of the other, uh, uh, you know, ones at the time. Six is actually above. There are some that only have five rounds, and of course, there are a handful that have ten rounds. Um, so that's how that works. There, you got your basic bolt action here um, with the short rifles they did do a downward turn um, bolt here your safety is this little little push here you, it's hard to do because if uh, you don't hold the uh, hold the actual handle down itself it will actually turn the handle but this is pretty much just your firing pin right here so you take that weight off of your firing pin and uh, now it's set like that. So that's how the safety works just like that. Uh, now, of course, to re uh, get it off, you gotta push it. It's a little hard to do from that angle. You gotta push it in and rotate it back into place. Now you have your gun ready to go again. I'm gonna pop that back like that open uh, to take it out it's like most bolt guns where you push the trigger backwards towards the back to release the bolt uh, unlike with a moniker rifle you actually push the trigger forward and when we do the review to the moniker here soon uh, when i get some ammo you're gonna see that autism break five four three two one Do you hate energy drinks that taste too strong, have artificial sweeteners, or tons of syrup in them, tons of caffeine, makes you jittery, little, you know, crackheady like? Well, guess who you're gonna, probably gonna like? Liquid Freedom Energy by Blood of Tyrants. These guys have been working here with the partners, uh, been working here with the channel here for about a month now. Um, started just before the New Mexico trip when I introduced them up on the mountain. Now, this is a non-carbonated, non-artificially sweetened, non-syrup sweetened uh, energy drink with low caffeine at about 100 milligrams. Uh, and it's all sweetened with uh, stevia and monk fruit extract. So 
good natural sweeteners, but this is not an overly sweet product. It is uh, actually pretty mild. It tastes just like a slightly sweetened raspberry tea, which I like. Firstly, I'm a lemon tea guy. Hopefully they'll come out with a sweet lemon tea in the future. I live in Texas, so sue me, the South. But anyways, these guys are really great. Their parent company is uh, Blood of Tyrants. They make wine as well, along with some cool little accessories and stuff like that. I'm gonna have the link right here on the screen along with a QR code. So please go check out the people who support us and support them because they support us. And well, it's liquid freedom. What more do you want? Freedom. So anyways, guys, let's get back to the content. Now, let's talk about the bayonet real fast because that's one of the most interesting things about this rifle. Now, the bayonet on this is a folding bayonet and you actually have two separate buttons on this. Your first button here is the actual release from the... Uh... Man, I am brain dead today from the bayonet lug. And in the back one here is how you actually fold, uh, unfold it. So you push the button down, pull it forward, rotate it up, and then push it back down, and then boom, you've got your bayonet or a nice little knife that you can do some stabby stuff with. Um, now, this particular uh, bayonet, if I remember correctly, is the second iteration of the bayonet. There was a, uh, the first generation had a different locking mechanism for the bayonet lug that was not as good. Uh, and yeah, so here's the thing about this whole rifle setup. And one of the reasons why I got this rifle setup, I believe I spent 650 or 750 on this on this rifle. Uh, I think it was 650 I spent on this on this rifle, and I got the rifle, the bayonet, box of ammo, and one clip. Now, the reason why I did this is for a couple couple things. One, it's an educational opportunity. Uh, it's it's still a really nice Kakarno. This thing is gorgeous. Um, but it's not original, uh, and it came with a bayonet. And this bayonet on its own is worth more than the rifle is. So I got a good deal on the bayonet itself. These normally run for like four or $500, uh, depending on which iteration they, uh, they are. So I'm already in the plus. I got a shooting rifle. I got some ammo um, and whatnot. Now you can also do this bayonet, un uh, unfold it on the rifle itself. Uh, you just gotta do the same thing, but it's harder to do because you gotta have multiple hands um, to do it. So, a little bit harder to do. Now, uh, we're gonna bring it in here, uh, the camera in, and we're gonna talk about some of the markings because some of the markings on this rifle is what makes it kind of interesting and kind of a little bit more valuable on its own, despite it being a bastardized stock. So I'm going to, Turn the camera, zoom in, and then we'll uh, show you those. All right, now I'm probably going to have to post pictures on the video to show the markings because the new camera doesn't focus very well up close. Um, so it is what it is. So up top here, um, one of the things that they changed on the uh, uh, the short rifles and then also all the other carbine, uh, carbines and Kakarnos is they switch to this fixed um, sight, uh, rear sight block right here. Pretty much they had figured out that most of the uh, shooting was being done. 200 uh, meters or yards was more than enough. You didn't need that big giant long sight that gave you up to 2000 yards of, uh, you know, volley fire, stuff like that. Most people were not shooting that in World War II. So they switched this solid uh, rear notch, they didn't really change the front. And then on the 7.3 rifles, uh, what they did is right here on the rear sight block, it's actually stamped 7.35 on, on the block. It's also supposed to be stamped on the stock itself. However, it's not there. Um, and that's part of, uh, you know, from the stock being refinished. So my guess is somebody had steamed the stock knocked out a bunch of the things, uh, the, the dents, sanded it down, and um, we lost the serial number on the stock and the caliber um, markings when that happened. Now, some of the other things here on the stock here, right here on the side, you actually have the date 
which is 1939 for this particular rifle. And then you also have some Roman numerals. And if I remember correctly, that ends up being the, uh, the, the number of the Imperial Italian communist empire date, some like that, you know, their dynasty or whatever, whatever they, the, the, the Italians called it is what the, the uh, Roman numerals are for. Then right here on the top, we have the builder's number and then we have, see right here, the serial number here on the barrel and then a mark. Now I'm gonna turn the rifle around here because one of the things that make this rifle a little bit more rare and collectible is right here underneath the serial number, the lack of any markings right here. A lot of these short rifles came to the United States from Finland. Uh, the Italians made a bunch of them for Finland gave them to Finland. Finland stamped their own guns on there. And then later on in the war, they probably also collected some themselves uh, from pickups and probably stamped them. But anyways, there should be a stamp here in a square box with an SA that is missing, which means this rifle, also the fact that this rifle has no um, import marks anywhere that I can find so far. So it's very likely this rifle was originally a, br uh, a bring back from a soldier um, back in the day from the Italian front or somewhere where the Italians were fighting, which is a really neat little piece of history on the gun itself. Now, one day I might go ahead and find a original stock that is not trashed and swap it out. The problem is they're kind of hard to find as uh, I have a Italian uh, Kakarno 6.5 long rifle um, that is in a sport ride stock and I have been unable to find a uh, original stock for it for years now at this point. I got the rifle for 60 bucks and uh, I figured why not, you know, a $60 rifle. But I didn't want to do a review on it until it was an original military configuration stock because I'm not real big into sporterized guns in most contexts. So, it is what it is. But once I got this one, oh, also another thing that they did is they sw swapped all of the swing swivels to the uh, to the, the side on here, opposite of the bolt, because it's easier to carry a rifle on your back than over your shoulder, especially if you're doing a lot of uh, hiking or uh, trekking uh, in formation, whatnot like that. So. That's that. Now let's get into the bear in the room, the elephant in the room, the chinchilla in the room, whatever you want to call that is in the room that makes this rifle um, interesting and an abomination at the same time. And that is the stock itself. Um, the stock was uh, clearly refinished. Now, the reason I know it's refinished one, because we it's, been varnished which is not an original finish uh, and then it's missing the numbers but also the main thing which is right here on the bottom and i'll have pictures for a close-up and this right here is an iron eagle a german stamp um, on this rifle which would suggest that this is a german captured kakarno that was used in the German military um, by the Nazis. Problem with that is nothing else on this rifle matches uh, that specific thing. First of all, this is a very small uh, stamping right here. And you can tell on here, there was no attention made to not sand over or steam this particular area. So my thought is this stamp was made after uh, the stock was sanded down and steamed out and stained, but before the clear coat was put on because there was clear coat inside of the stamping. So someone tried to pass this rifle off as a um, German captured Kakarno that has the Iron Eagle stamp on it. Now, the other thing that really sets this off and lets you know that this isn't really a German Kakarno is the fact that, well, it's in 7.5 and still has the six round clip. The German Kakarnos, from what I understand, all the ones that were actually captured and repurposed and used by the Germans in the uh, end of the war, 
they were converted to eight, mil, um, eight millimeter Mauser and single shot eight millimeter Mauser. So basically what they did is they bored out the, the, the chamber in the barrel to make eight millimeter Mauser. And then they took out the guts of the, um, the magazine system and just put a feed plate there where you could just drop one cartridge in, rack it and fire it. Uh, now this action is more than capable of handling eight millimeter Mauser, but it was too much engineering to make it functionally work as an eight millimeter Mauser, especially how eight millimeter Mauser is quite a bit bigger. And I'll show you a comparison right now, really fast. Here I got a surplus um, eight millimeter Mauser. This is 1955 production. And if you see the difference here in the cases, it would, it could have been possible to make, uh, I mean, it was possible to make this fit in the rifle, but it is not possible to make it run in the magazine itself. So that's the whole reasoning behind that and how we know that this is not a real German captured uh, Kakarno that was used in service. Therefore, that stamp has to be fake. Um, now, the funny story is when I bought this rifle from the guy, I assume he's the one who bought it and he probably bought it at a gun show, not knowing what he uh, was buying. He probably got this, the uh, saw, oh, there's an Iron Eagle on it. It's collectible. Okay, so he bought it. And uh, if I remember correctly, it still had the tag on it when I bought it from the gun show and he paid $950 for it. So yeah, he paid far more than this rifle was uh, worth and he paid for a fake uh, because he didn't do a little bit of research. Now, there's one last little feature on this uh, rifle I did want, to, uh, forgot to go over. So because they had the folding bayonet down here, um, that was supposed to be attached to the rifle all the time, they no longer kept a cleaning rod up beneath the rifle. So they switched it to a trapdoor uh, in the buttstock. However, there is not one in there. It is missing the uh, the cleaning rod. So that is missing. Um, obviously, they also changed up the hardware. It, overall, this is a really nice looking rifle. It really is. It shoots pretty good. A little sloppy, Kakarno, you know, stuff. But overall, it's a really nice rifle. Now, one of the things that the Kakarno really had over a lot of the other rifles in World War II was the weight. This thing, empty, with the bayonet is light. And I actually brought a scale over here so we can test the weight right now. And it's gonna be a little tricky doing this. I'm gonna compare the Kakarno and I'm gonna compare the main competitor, um, the, uh, the K98 Mauser. Put it like so here. So not counting the box of ammo, we're sitting at 8.2 pounds, which is probably uh, that 0.2 pounds is probably the ammo box itself. Uh, all the rounds in there are empty. So let's take out the K98. I gotta really press this to get it to turn on. Okay, nine points, nine point six pounds. So we picked up over two pounds. Now let's say, let's compare this also to an Arasaka. Now the Arasaka is pretty light as well, even despite being super, this particular one being long. This one's still 8.2 pounds. Okay. Now let's compare. Let's go with another carbine. We'll do the Mosin Nagant. Eight point nine pounds for the Mosin. Now we'll do America's submission for World War Two. The O three A three. 8.3 pounds. And last but not least, we're we'll gonna do a Britain's entry 
which is going to be the Lee Enfield. This is a Mark IV. Eight point eight, uh, eight point eight three pounds. So, as you can see, oh, if I can get this here. So, as you can see, the Gacarno really is the lightest of all of the service rifles in World War II that are bolt action rifles. And at least out of the sampling that I have, there may be something that's a little bit lighter out there. I would say if anything's going to compete with Gacarno, I'm going to say it would probably be an Arasaka short rifle. Um, I don't know if they made any carbines or how short they did make their rifles, but that would be the only thing I can think of that would compete as far as weight with the Gacarno. But anyways, guys, otherwise than that, this is a great rifle uh, for a collector. If you can find one that's in original condition, I believe our buddies over at Royal Tiger Imports has some in stock, but they're going to be um, various grades. So keep that in mind. Uh, some of them are going to be grade B and up, but I, they do have hand select and they do have some restored rifles. I believe they take some of their best rifles, clean them up and sell those as semi restored or restored rifles. Um, so check them out. Uh, great partners. Uh, really, really like them. Good prices, a lot of stuff. And if you're looking for project guns, if you're not looking for a shooter, if you're looking just for something to fill a gap in your collector, you're not your collection, you're not really wanting to shoot it that much or at all, World Tiger is a great, uh, you know, great source to get something relatively cheap. But anyways, guys, that's it for the M38 Kakarno Carbine. And um, yeah, see y'all next time.